This is the first video on logarithms and exponentials. Now the videos are really aimed at people who are roughly at school lever or university introduction level. In particular, they're suitable for engineering undergraduates, perhaps doing a first year course in mathematics. This first video is going to give a reminder of powers and indices, but really this is a lead-in to exponential functions and then later on in the series exponentials and logarithms. Now the video is not going to be particularly formal as you might expect for a mathematics undergraduate but we're going to use common sense language which hopefully makes it more understandable for your average student. Powers and indices then. We need to make sure that students understand these before we move on to exponentials. Here are some basic uses of indices. You'll see x and then with this power 2 means x times x or x with the power 3 means x times x times x i.e. three lots of x's multiplied together and so on you can see x to the 6 and x to the n. Now if we want to multiply two things together which have a power in essence you're going to add the indices. So here's an example. I've done x squared <coughs> and I'm going to multiply that by x to the power 4. So you see there's the x squared, two of them, there's the x to the 4, four of them, and you'll see in total I've got six x's and so the answer is x to the 6 and you can see in essence what I've done is write x to the 2 plus 4. So I've added the original indices. If you look at the second example x cubed times x to the n, you see I have three x's here, n x's here, so the total number of x's I have now is n plus 3, and so you see the answer is x to the power n plus 3. So when I multiply things together and they've got powers, I just add the powers or the indices. What happens if I have a negative index, which is quite useful and comes up a lot? Well, a negative index means division or put the function in the denominator. The two are the same, really. So here's an example. x to the minus 2 means 1 over x squared. You can see two x's, but in the denominator, because the power is a minus. x to the minus 3, I've got three x's, but it's 1 over x cubed, because it's x to the minus 3. Or x to the minus n is 1 over x to the n. Now, when you're dividing complex numbers with indices, what you find is you have to subtract the indices. So we've got a few examples here just to make sure you understand why this is the case. So we'll start with this one. x to the power 6 divided by x cubed can be written as look, the 6 x's on top or multiplied, 3 x's underneath, and if we do the cancellation, cancel, 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 like that, you see what you get left with is x cubed, which in essence is x to the 6 minus 3. You'll see we've taken the power from the top and subtracted the power from the denominator. What about x squared over x to the 4? 2x is on top, 4x is underneath. If I go cancel like that, you see I get left with 1 over x squared, which is x to the minus 2, or I could have written it as x to the 2 minus 4, where the 2 came from the numerator and the 4 from the denominator. Or I have another example here, x squared over x to the n can be simply written as x to the 2 minus n. So you see I subtract the index of the denominator from the index of the numerator. <coughs> I could do a slightly more complex expression if you'd like one. So here we go, x to the power n times x to the 7 over x to the r, x to the 3. And you'll notice I just add the powers of the numerator subtract the powers of the denominator. So I get this, 7 plus n, that's from the numerator, minus r minus 3, that's from the denominator, and so the result is this, x to the 4 plus n minus r. And here's a slightly messier one where I've got x's and y's, but you'll see if I use these rules of indices, it's straightforward. I've got an x to the 8 times an x to the minus 3 divided by an x to the 4, so that gives me this, x to the 8 minus 3, that's from there, minus 4, that's from there, and then I multiply by the y terms, I've got y to the 5 from here, and y to the minus 1 from here. And there's the result, 
x to the y, x y to the power 4. Now, next thing that we need to look at is fractional powers, or powers which are not integers. Now, there is some discussion of this in the videos on complex numbers for those who are ready for complex numbers, but here we're going to look solely at real numbers and give some simple examples. A good way to get insight into what a fractional power might be is to ask whether we can use an index or a power to represent a square root operation in such a way that we get a rule which is consistent with the usage for integer powers. So what we mean is you're writing things like x to the a times x to the b equals x to the a plus b and you're happy that works with integers. Well, can we find an a and a b that represents a square root operation and such that this type of rule still works so our mathematics is consistent throughout? Let's try it then. Let's assume there exists an index which represents the square root. So here we go. First of all, the normal sum. The square root of 4 squared gives me square root of 4 times square root of 4, which gives me 4. That's fine. You're saying, yeah, that's the definition of square root, no problem. And now I'm going to assume that I can represent the square root of 4 with an index. So I'm going to write it as 4 to the power a, which is what I've done there. Now, if that's the case, if I write 4 to the power a times 4 to the power a, using my rules for indices, I'm going to get 4 to the power 2a. But I know that if 4 to the a is the square root of 4, then 4 to the 2a must be 4, or 4 to the 1. And that tells me that 2a must be equal to 1. In other words, a equals a half. So this is what we've got. The square root of x can be written as x to the power 0.5. Let's try this with cube roots then and see if we can get a similar rule. So <laughs> if I write the cube root of w cubed, then what I get is the cube root of w times the cube root of w times the cube root of w, which gives me w. What I'm going to do next is say, can I find a power which is equivalent to the cube root of w. So can I write w to the b that gives me the cube root? Well, here we do. Here we do it. So I write w to the power b times w to the power b times w to the power b. And that gives me w to the power 3b. And if w to the power b is the cube root of w, w to the 3b must be equal to w or w to the 1. And therefore, 3b must be equal to 1 or b equals a third. And hence, here's our result. The cube root of w is w to the power one third. Now, I could follow this same analogy for all levels of roots, things like fourth roots, fifth roots, the two thirds root, and so on. Now, I'm going to assume here that w is bigger than one, just for convenience. And what you will find is the square root of w is bigger than the cube root of w, is bigger than the fourth root of w, is bigger than the fifth root of w, and so on. In other words, w to the half is bigger than w to the third, is bigger than w to the quarter, is bigger than w to the fifth, and so on. And what you can see here is we're beginning to get close to a continuum. Here we had w to the half, and then we had w to the 0 0.33, and then w to the 0 0.25, and then w to the 0 0.2, and I could have gone on and tried w to the minus 0 0.2, which obviously puts the w in the denominator, w to the minus 0 0.25, and so on. And you see these numbers, these powers, are beginning to look a bit like a continuum. And it's not hard to imagine that I could stick a value in here, something like w to the 0 0.22, and it has a sensible meaning. So, a non-integer power will represent something like a square root or similar. And if we put these as a continuum, this is what we expect. If w is bigger than 1, that's quite a big assumption, and c is bigger than a, is bigger than b, then w to the power c is bigger than w to the power a, which is bigger than w to the power b. An example of this, just to convince you, is if I let w equal 5, then you can see 5 cubed is bigger than 5 to the 2.8, which is bigger than 5 squared, 
which is bigger than 5 to the 1.5, which is bigger than 5 to the 0 0.9, which is bigger than 5 to the 0 0.2, which is bigger than 5 to the minus 1. So what you can see is if I arrange these indices in order, then putting 5 to the index will also appear in order. So here's a plot just to show that that's exactly what you get. So I've plotted 2 to the x and 3 to the x. So unsurprisingly, 2 to the power 1 is 2, 2 to the power 2 is 4, but and 2 to the power 0 is 1. But you can see I've also got all these intermediate values. So if I go down here where this is a half, then the value I've got from this will be the square root of 2. And if I go to 1 and a half, then that won't be the square root of 2, that'll be 2 to the power 3 over 2, and so on. But the key thing to note is that there's a continuum here. I can plot it as a continuum. Now clearly, if I go to 3 to the power x, then x equals 1, I get 3, x equals 2, I get 9, and so on. And here's an important observation. These functions are monotonic you can see they're continually increasing as x increases, then 3 to the x increases, all the way up to infinity. So they're monotonic, and another term you'll come across, they're also 1 to 1, which means for every value of x, there's a unique value of 3 to x, and vice versa. So where do we want to finish this particular video? Well, there's two power functions which are widely used in engineering. They're these. 10 to the power x and e to the power x. Now the use of 10 is perhaps fairly obvious because we use base 10 in lots of number theory, but the use of e you might consider a bit odd. Now the obvious rationale for that is this. The e value has this property. d dx of e to the power x equals e to the power x, and this property makes it very easy to use for many mathematical operations. You will also find, if you're solving ordinary differential equations, that the solutions automatically come out in the format e to the ax. And therefore, it's a very useful power function to you. So what you'll see is we'll use 10 to the x, but in fact, e to the x is far more common. So conclusions. We've reminded you of the properties of indices. That gives us um, basically things like this, f to the x times f to the y equals f x plus y. These power functions have a monotonic property, so assuming w is bigger than 1, then c greater than a greater than b gives you w to the power c greater than w to the power a greater than w to the power b. The most common power functions are with bases 10 or e, so we get 10 to the x or e to the x, and e to the x is known as an exponential function.